push straight into the next session. Uh, if you have to get up and go get some refreshment or if it's the restroom. Anyway, so we're going to skip the break, but feel free to get up and go around. We're just going to try to keep up together so we get to happy hours. Um, I want to introduce uh, Charles Roth, who is the executive director of Codafil. Um, if you don't know, Codafil will be celebrating 50 years next year, and there will be a year-long celebration. That is something that we'll um, and so with CREATE, of course, our French heritage and language is a very important piece of this initiative, as I think it's what sets us apart from other cities and is really an intricate part of our identity. And so not only is it fun for culture and fun to speak French, but it's also an important pillar of our economy as well. And so uh, Monsieur Laurent is going to walk us through kind of how, why we do French immersion and how that kind of shows itself as people enter the workforce and why they should be rewarded a little bit more for that. So well, help me welcome Mr. Charles Laurent. Merci Kate, bonjour, comment ça va? Tout le monde parle français? Oui. Oh, mais ça c'est magnifique. Alors moi c'est Charles Laroque, je viens d'un petit village qui s'appelle Generet, Louisiana. Everyone speaks French, right? Yeah, someone's lying in here. Um, Codeville is going to be 50 years old next year. And uh, it, what a wonderful way to help us celebrate our 50 years by being part of this wonderful adventure led by the city of Lafayette, Mayor Rubido, Kate, the point person on that, CREATE. This is a wonderful trampoline, a springboard for uh, beautiful products and services we hope to come out of this. So you're wondering what's the alligator got to do with all that? Well. We're talking about our cultural heritage economy. And we know one thing that back, I recall, back in the 60s, no one ever talked about alligators. Maybe, maybe you saw some pictures in wildlife and fisheries, uh, I think they used to have a magazine called The Con Conservative or, or uh, Conservation. And there would be a picture of an alligator. And you'd never see an alligator. We lived on by cash. And Today they're everywhere. They are everywhere. Well, they were an endangered species. And what we're saying right now is that where are we going to be in our economy as a state 30 years from now when a lot of these rich human resources will no longer be with us, these endangered species, our Louisiana French speakers, French and Creole speakers, so what they did with the alligators back in the late 60s and early 70s, they put them on an endangered uh, species list. And they, they pretty much succeeded in, in saving them. They're no longer on the endangered species list. Um, we have farmers now that cull eggs from the marshes. And state law requires these alligator harvesters to return 12% of the hatchlings by the time they are three feet long, back to their natural habitat. Well, my little presentation this morning is going to be about that. In other words, let's think about how we can plow back into the natural habitat what we have and what we are incubating today in our schools. No explanation necessary. We talked about this morning, Greg Gautreaux talked about the importance of investing, exploring, and extracting our natural resources. Well, this is the same thing. In, in diversifying our economy, we are looking at new ways to explore extracting a new natural resource. It's actually not new, it's been here all along, but something that we've not been paying attention to our native French and Creole speakers and the over 5,000 
Louisiana students that are functionally bilingual in our 32 programs throughout the state. So we're going to think a little about diversification and in terms of uh, the oil patch, maybe a little directional drilling. Maybe we need to find different ways to extract those natural resources. And this is why. These are not barbarians at the gates. They're our children. Since 1983, Louisiana has had French immersion in schools. Since 1983, we have had over 25,000 of those little people become people like my own children who are in their 30s now. And we've been letting them down. We have never yet made a practical application of their linguistic skills to our economy. And this is not just a shame. In French we say c'est criminel. And that needs to change. And only you, as leaders, especially our economic developers, can bring that 900 pound gorilla into the room of the decision makers. This is who we're talking about. You know, we, it, it's such a, we have new programs that we're beginning, and uh, we got one that just started in uh, Management Parish, two actually, one in Ville Platte and one in Mamou. And I had a meeting with the, uh, the principals and the superintendent and the mayors of Ville Platte and Mamou to talk about what I'm talking about today. And one of the principals said, you know, I'm getting calls from Mamou. Parents and grandparents are calling me and, and thanking me, and they're in tears because they see themselves in these little children who are coming home and speaking in French. School's been gone on for only a week now, and they're already bringing French home. This is the kindergartners. And these, these senior citizens, or they see themselves in their children when they were forbidden to speak French. So, Greg Gautreau said this morning that education is the number one inhibitor for attracting uh, outsiders to this area. These programs are catalysts. This is what makes us better than anyone around. Everyone in the country understands the success of Louisiana's French immersion programs. But they're asking us right now, so what are you going to do with it? We have great support. The Acadiana delegation, Lieutenant Governor, the Governor, they, they understand the importance of French immersion but mainly at the level of the iconic status of French in Louisiana. We have to educate our elected officials in the economic applications because when we look just in this area, we lost, what, 10,000 jobs in the oil patch? Just in, around Lafayette, 10,000 jobs? Again, we have 5,000 children in programs around the state who are, for all intents and purposes, bilingual by the time they're 10, 11 years old. You can parachute them in France, in Africa, in, in Quebec, Belgium, anywhere, and they will survive. They will not only survive, they will thrive. The thing is, is that it's difficult right now for us to articulate our elementary programs on through high school. We have Lafayette High School, which is really the only French immersion high school in the state. We need to get more at that secondary level because by the time these kids, you know, graduate from, from middle school, they have French hardwired into their brains forever. It's always there. And so they graduate and they go on and they go to college and they still have the notions of French. And we were talking about that earlier with 
someone about how our universities need to start accommodating these 25,000 kids who've been coming out of these programs in their different schools of engineering, media production, medicine, you name it, for them to get a leg up on the competition because they can lead missions of Doctors Without Borders in French, in Haiti, for example. The opportunities are incredible. So, they just ain't there. There are little to no jobs available for, you know, normally available for these children. So, you know, we think, what's the lowest hanging fruit? Obviously, the cultural economy. Obviously, tourism. Obviously, we have francophone visitors that come from all over the world and many of them leave somewhat disappointed because there was no French. Like Barry Onsolet says, they have to find it almost like on a safari at Walmart when you hear someone speak in French. It's almost like serendipity. Why is it still hidden? So what do we do with these children? Yeah. We know where they go. Now we got this hurricane coming, right? It's going to Texas and the governor says, pray, pray for our neighbors, pray for our neighbors in Texas. More importantly these days, we want to pray for them because many of the people that are in the, in the path of those hurricanes are our own family members that have left Louisiana to live in Houston, in Austin, wherever. And we know that when every Thanksgiving, when you look at all the Texas license plates in town, my goodness, it's incredible. The Crawfish Festival. So, and then when we have a hurricane in Louisiana, they all want to come from Texas and everywhere else come over here because this is the place to be when there's a hurricane. We'll at least have a party or something. So, yeah, French does equal jobs. And until our, our leaders uh, buy into that, it's going to be budget crisis after budget crisis after budget crisis. We're looking at a potential resource that is laying dormant. And it is a miracle that French is still alive today. We have something very substantial on which we can graft these, these children coming out of French immersion. We have um, a French that has been marginalized, unfortunately, over the years through, of course, slavery, uh, Indian removal, and of course, the deportation. So it has gone underground for so long, in a, in a way that was an advantage because that helped preserve it. So it's still there, it's still there. But sometimes it feels like it's not there. And there's this concept called celestalgia. It's like feeling homesick, but you're still at home. And I think that's what our General Melez is over here. We have like uh, the phantom member of an amputee. Something is itching, but nothing is there to scratch. Nothing is there to get relief. And so we're looking for it in different ways. And many people, you know, make that quest in their own way. Of course, the, the chance of having a prosthetic is there. Is it the same as it used to be? You know, is it the same French that they were speaking here in the 1800s and the early 1900s? No. You know, it is 21st century French for 21st century applications. But it can help relieve that itch. It can help reaffirm our identity. And it can help, can help us as a compass for where we're going in the future because it is in our DNA. But when we go back, we know that uh, there, was, there was discrimination, there was abuse, 
And of course, it was forbidden. If you didn't know that, in 1916, French was forbidden in the schools. And then we had the wars, World War I, World War II, where a lot of our, our Cajuns and Creoles were exposed to Les Américains. And they came back with those influences, be it in music, of course, language, the English language started uh, surpassing French. And then the oil patch, obviously, people from Oklahoma, Texas, Pennsylvania, came into the schools as well. And they meant well because they understood that people needed jobs, but they didn't realize that we could keep our mother tongue as well. And then uh, there was the exodus to New Orleans. And, you know, prior to, I could be wrong, but I, I think that prior to World War II, uh, there was really very little French. French was dying out. My own great-grandmother, <coughs> who was from France, had a, uh, uh, a stationery shop on, uh, on Bourbon Street, actually. And she would go into Maison Blanche, and she would make them speak, wait on her in French. But that was the last of a dying breed until around the 1940s when you had all these Fontenot's leaving the uh, Evangelion Parish cotton country because of the boll weevil and you go to Galatoire's over there and that's, that's who the, the French waiters are. They're, they're Cajuns and Creoles from, uh, from Evangelion Parish, for example. And then now you can't walk down a street in, 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 in the uh, French Quarter and not hear Zydeco music, I mean, that is really alien to New Orleans. And then Bruce Dagerbaum, of course, he's from Marksville to begin with. And then, you know, down the bayou, all of the folks that have given New Orleans that Cajun and Creole brand that is really not theirs. But, you know, everyone can play. And so in 1968, Codafield was created to kind of remedy that situation. And again, like uh, someone was saying, I think it was Zoe and Greg Gotro speaking this morning, I'm quoting just him. But he, uh, he had mentioned how uh, important outsiders, the perception of outsiders uh, is to us in telling us, in affirming what we have, that it is, it is valuable, it is of value. And so we had, we had the French, we had the Quebecois, we had the Belgians, all coming in here in the 60s and the 70s and saying, wow, what you guys have, you need to preserve that. And so the Jimmy Gamangeos and these people said, sure, why not? That's a good idea. Let's, let's, let's create a state agency. And they did. And so now over the past 50 years with folks like you know, Barry Ancelay on the board, David Cherami was, was director of Codafil. Uh, we've, we've saved French. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> the question is, these French and, and, and French Canadians and Belgians are asking us, okay, now what are you going to do with it? So that's where we are. So why not develop a bilingual workforce, okay? They're out there. Let's, let's put them to work. Um, they have the linguistic competence. It's a question right now of it becoming formalized and saying, okay, our state is gonna do something. Let's start in Lafayette. They have this wonderful CREATE initiative. They have over a thousand students in French immersion. Let's, uh, let's do a little directional drill here right now and, and get this, this guy going. So it's a school to work type initiative where you know these kids are not leaving French on the school ground now. They're gonna take it with them and they're gonna take it to the office. They're gonna take it to work. So we can train, we can specialize, obviously, again, the lowest hanging fruit is tourism. Uh, we can certify these cultural workers as being fluent in French or able to provide service in French. And we can, we should incentivize them as well. So we'll talk about, you know, uh, our musicians over here support them and, and buy their albums, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing here because we are talking about cultural economy workers, creative class who can speak English, yes, and a heritage language, French and or Creole. So we need to market, develop the market, 
and collaborate with partners to identify existing Louisiana French products and services. And that brings us to a couple of laws that Codafil is charged in executing and the French language services program, we want to be able to identify all of any public servant who is able to provide a service in French, be they at the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, Health and Human Services, and they're there, they're out there. They're, they're not legion, but they are out there. And then we can say, by the way, you know, we have these, these young people coming out of these French immersion programs that are able to and, and uh, willing to take the place of the person who is providing that service who will not, who's going to be retiring in, in 10 years, for example. Then we have the Francophone Friendly, or we call it French Friendly Act, to develop a certification system whereby vendors, festivals, and restaurants may be designated Francophone Friendly and design and issue a marquee that may be displayed by each entry, entity. Rather. And, you know, we talk about attracting snowbirds here. If we don't make the effort to identify which real estate agent, which pharmacy, which doctor, which lawyer, and, they, and we have them all that speak French, butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, and a lot of Indians too, especially in the home. So, you know, we got the brand equity um, that adds value to uh, to our our uh, our brand, but as Greg was saying this morning, unity. You know, can we all come to the same table? Can we can we say that we're going to go beyond the kitsch and we're going to go to the real? When we say authentic, we're talking about Merlene Herbert who was here this morning. I can recall when I was teaching in Lafayette Parish, I brought students who had behavioral problems and I was teaching a cultural tourism class and with Miss Merlin, they made their own bilingual local cookbook, recipe book from their own family recipes. And she brought those children to Albertsons, and she let them try out their recipes in her restaurant and serve those kids' recipes to her customers. And she speaks fluent French, that's her mother tongue. And every one that was mentioned in Connie's wonderful documentary there, MNS, uh, Dwyer's, all of these play lunches places, you know, they speak French. You know, why, why is there a veil in front of that? Let's bring them out and let's honor them. So we have this, uh, this French friendly uh, initiative right now where on our website we're starting to identify. Uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy process, but we want to make it available to everyone and the information is given on who is able to pro provide what service, where and when in French. but we don't want to kill the goose that's laying the golden eggs, okay? We need to nourish this, this, new, this new vision and we need to keep feeding it so that we grow the model and, you know, we got as many passive francophones as we do active francophones and by that, I mean, it's hardwired in people's brains by the time when they were babies, when they were born. And we need to, we need to jumpstart them and get them involved in this initiative too. And many of them have a vested interest, but when you look at, um, when you look at the uh, economic opportunities right now, there are many people that could really be adding uh, great value to this who are already out there. We need to network and in Louisiana and with our international transcultural family. When I say transcultural, 
it can be Acadian, it can be Afro-Caribbean, it can be African. You know, we Cotofil has these agreements, these international understandings with France and Belgium and Canada and Martinique and Guadeloupe. And you know, those those people are just so interested in Louisiana and wanting to have some kind of a role to play in the Louisiana Francophone uh, reality. So again, they're no longer talking about saving French. They rightfully understand that we've saved French. They're talking about business right now. They want to do business with us. And it might be Bell Helicopters that is Montreal based. It might be, you know, a petrochemical company on, on the on the river. There are so many Pardon? Yes, yes. Media production, IT, it's all out there. So this is this is uh, about two years old right now. The Réseau de Ville Francophone et Francophile d'Amérique. Uh, it was founded by Joe Robido's predecessor, um, Joey Durrell, along with uh, the mayor of Quebec City and the mayor of Moncton. And today there are 140 municipalities that are members of this network. It is, it is free. It is, uh, it, it, it is an incredible opportunity. We went there with this delegation. You recognize some faces in there. The Lieutenant Governor went there with us. He even signed an agreement representing the state of Louisiana, a cooperative agreement with the province of Quebec. Um, as, a, as a sidebar note, um, in a couple of weeks, we're going back up because there is a second meeting of an association between Quebec and Louisiana legislators, parliamentarians, and our legislators. And they're, they're the ones that will be talking about, for example, the aviation industry and you know, economic development because Quebec has these parliamentary connections with Massachusetts, New York, and California. And Massachusetts, it's about Quebec selling hydroelectricity and Massachusetts selling biomedical expertise, et cetera, et cetera. We have a lot that we can be doing at the, uh, the free trade level there too. So what is this network? I think it's godsend really because uh, Joe, um, Joe Robido went up there. He was extremely well received. He was very involved. He participated. Lafayette is going to be part of this for a long time, but the basis is the, the Francophone connections there. And Francophile, you don't have to be able to speak French. You have cities there like Dubuque, Iowa, for example. The French language is not a part of it, but the history is the same. So there's a lot of promotion and development, economic development, that can come out of this uh, through these alliances. And again, this is who we're talking about. This whole conversation is about these little people right here. And the question is, are we going to build the infrastructure that will support economic opportunities for the French that they will be mastering, that there, many of them have already mastered? So we need to manage the model. And New paradigms. No one uses that word anymore. Remember when it used to be a big buzzword? Paradigm. Well, anyway. So we want to invite international Francophone family to invest expertise and resources in Louisiana French enterprise with possibilities for return on that investment. So, opportunity machine, are you in the house? Uh, you know, all of these economic development uh, uh, initiatives and visions, the gorilla is awake right now. And I'm, I'm throwing it out there. It's time to invite Louisiana French to become a viable, dynamic partner with the rest of you guys who are doing it in English. Because there's a tremendous market, Francophone market and Francophile market, out there just waiting for the invitation. So, okay. And we want to reach for higher hanging fruit. You know, we know that the lowest hanging fruit, we say, is tourism. But there are other sectors. And as an example, 
we are helping New Iberia, French Immersion, at their uh, uh, elementary school inject a Louisiana Creole language component to French Immersion. Why? Because, well, for one, New Iberia is twinned with a city in Haiti. And for two, the National Guard is, Louisiana National Guard is partnered with Haiti. And they're looking to recruit young military personnel who can speak Creole French. And we have at that particular school in New Iberia, they have four Creole language teachers. They are from Haiti, they are from Guadeloupe, and um, where else? I'm not sure, Martinique. And we're trying to mesh the local French to validate it into a more universal, not French, but Creole, Creole, into a more universal Creole for applications, be they in Haiti, in the Indian Ocean, National Guard, for example, is interested in partnering with an African nation, and we know that there is a drone base in the Seychelles, Somalian pirates. So then we harvest and release. So we're looking for 12% to plow back into the habitat. Um, my question is, can we do as much for our children as we've done for our reptiles? It's a fair question, I think. Again, um, if, if, if you were to, I mean, just look what wildlife and fisheries did with that alligator. What dollar value today in Louisiana's cultural economy does that reptile represent? From tours on Lake Martin to Troy Landry shooting alligators in the basin to postcards, whatever. You know, everyone wants to come to Louisiana and see an alligator. Poor Florida. They used to be the alligator hub. Now it's Louisiana. Well, just imagine if we were to release this incredible energy and these resources coming out of our schools and, and grafted onto the existing Louisiana French and Creole, what kind of an economic impact would that have? Nothing less than major. So remember these guys? They'll be okay. They'll be okay. But this is what we're interested in. We want to keep our families here. We want to, we want to enhance our economy, and we want to bring our heritage, language, and culture to the 21st century. We want to vive, travailler, et jouer. Merci beaucoup. Any questions? Okay. Um, Charles, are y'all, is anyone working on an app? Uh, it just seems like a lot of what you said, if I could have, like what you're saying about being able to identify the people who, <laughs> identify the people who do speak French, and letting them add themselves to the directory, also being able to peg, like you said, the attorneys, the doctors, you know, you had put up a map up there, and I was like, yes. yeah, I can have that on an app in my phone, and it would be two-way where I can upload myself right. as a person who speaks French. Or that, that's, what's your name? Marie Ducote. Marie, that is exactly the idea, uh, and we're working on that. It's going to need a lot of collaboration. We are asking the people, the boots on the ground, they're your CDBs. You know your areas, you know, you talk to one or two or three people, and they can give you a list of all the French speakers, the barber, the butcher, the baker, everyone. And they would need to provide that information. It's, it's, it's not a, a, an easy task because you're going to get to the point where there will be a review. 
There'll be a Yelp type thing when people are going to say, hey, look, you know, I went to that place. No one spoke French. You know, it's going to be uh, tenuous to begin with, but at one point it's going to become independent and Codafield will not be managing that. It's going to have to be, and that's, that's where we are right now. The community is going to have to take ownership of their economies, their languages, their resources. It's not the iconic Codafield or the Department of Education or the government. It's going to have to come from the ground up and say, look, we want to be part of that result, that network, and this is going to be fun because we're going to contribute these, these businesses, these products, and these services, and, and we want the people to come and experience that. So, you know, the technology is there. Uh, it's just that uh, it's kind of a moving target, but I, I think we're going to get there, but it's going to have to be a concerted effort. Okay, question right here. I've always been fascinated by the, the Acadian, French, and Creole languages here. And I've always wondered, and I know that this is more economy and the older industry and all, but when you're talking about those children there, I've always wondered why you have little tiny pockets of French immersion and why we haven't used uh, AOC, community media to bring those instructors of French to um, record their lessons and be able to broadcast them where the schools could just plug in or even like the question beforehand with the app to, and especially since you've got these other instructors in New Iberia that apparently are bringing that other facet to interact and converse with the islands and why can't why can't we put that on a programming schedule and have all the schools and any parents who want to listen and learn to this wonderful language and, and not just limit it to bilingual, make them trilingual or give them four languages, bring in Spanish too. Well I meant to in 100% agreement with you, and um, you know, obviously, uh, uh, folks like Ed Bui and, and AOC, they have wonderful resources. Um, it, it will take coordination. Uh, most of our teachers come on J1 cultural exchange visas, which are they have they're very uh, rigid. Um, that's not to say that you know these teachers cannot. Um, cannot uh, think outside of the box for different type of projects. There is a cultural component where uh, they, they are required to have some kind of a cultural contribution, but invariably it's a sharing of their culture because it is a cultural exchange visa. So these teachers don't have a whole lot of time for different things, and at the same time, you know, they come here uh, they want to visit the areas too, so that's one thing. What we really need to do is increase our number of Louisiana French-speaking teachers who get it and where it makes sense. And we do have a program called Escadrille in Louisiana that we are we're uh, we're growing right now. But it's a very good idea. Question right here, sir. John. Yeah, uh, just a couple of things. For one thing, we have to be realistic about how language learning happens. And you know, it can be reinforced by television programming, but it can't be done by television programming. But what we what we could do, as you, you pointed out, uh, in terms of investing, we have to we have to invest. We can't just depend on this trickling down from the top of the government or anywhere else. There's a, a waiting list, a long waiting list in New Orleans and and, and just about every in Lafayette, just about every in place that there where we set up immersion programs, French immersion programs. There's a, a longer list of people who want to get in than can get in because we don't have enough teachers and enough time. This is what we need to work on, like uh, drastically and aggressively. If there's a long waiting list, that means that we don't have enough teachers, we don't have enough classes, we don't have enough immersion programs. It's not in enough parishes. It's not in enough schools in any parish. It ought to be, judging from this, 
because it's such a, hot, a, a huge potential for economic driving, it ought to be uh, one of our first priorities in absolutely every parish, and at least in South Louisiana. Uh, to, to make sure that it, it's uh, happening and that it's available to as many people who want to, to participate in it. The other thing it, uh, associated with what something you said was, you know, nobody learns to speak French to speak French. People learn to speak French to say something, to sell something, to buy something, to tell a story, to, to, to participate in society. And, and we have to go beyond just learning the language. We have to put it into play as you right, like rightfully said. And how you do that is what we're thinking about uh, today. I mean, it's a huge, huge uh, challenge, but other places have done it. New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. Quebec. Uh, it has been done. It's a known thing how to do it. And uh, what's lacking here is the willingness. Again, I agree 100 percent. And you know, teachers are getting harder and harder to find these days. And we have requests coming from Ruston, Lincoln Parish, you know, for French immersion. They understand the value of having a Cadillac program. Uh, you know, Natchitoches Parish, uh, parishes like Vermilion, for example. These are the uh, uh, the head scratchers here because they have no French immersion and they have shown no interest. In French immersion, of course, you know there's a long history there, and a lot of it is is uh, the source of that is the stigmatization, you know, early on. But the thing is, is that um, it is an economic driver, and it should be on the front burner for economic development. And um, again, I'm mighty much afraid that if, like you say, we're, we're teaching French just for someone to speak French, you know, if there are no economic applications then in 30 years when you're having your next CREATE uh, discussions, I'm not saying you'll be talking about Spanish, but I'm probably saying that you won't be talking about a foreign language. In, in this case, we're not talking about a foreign language. Yeah. We're talking about a homegrown language. One, one more uh, comment before I hand the microphone over. Um, you were talking about the value of French in terms of making connections to the French people world and having encouraging those visitors to come down visit both snowbirds and people from Europe and Africa and the Caribbean. But another experience that I've had in terms of French as a distinction and as a, a, a potential you know, uh, cog in the economic driving wheel was uh, experiences that we had at the Liberty Theater where people were coming from Nebraska and Wyoming and, and Wisconsin and everywhere else in order to not understand. <laughs> They were fascinated that there were people here who were speaking a language that, did, that that meant something to them and that they didn't understand, and they were just absolutely driven to visit this area uh, because there was a French president. And, and let me just say that I think those people from Nebraska, it's okay for them to talk about the Cajun mystique. But for us over here, we should never use that. Cajun mystique is nothing exotic about a mother tongue. You, you might be trying to scratch that itch where there's nothing to scratch, but there are ways to get relief. It's not a mystique, it's nothing mysterious. And Kate Durio, where's Kate? She's learning French right now. What a tremendous asset that's going to be to City Hall. You know, if you don't speak French, you make some effort and you don't have to become perfectly bilingual, but, you know, it's not mysterious. Okay, I have two questions, but I think they're similarly related. Um, I don't speak French yet. I'm learning <laughs> right now. Um, and so I just started a theater company trying to promote Cajun culture and French language in the performing arts. And so uh, part of it is how do people know? Is it like a choose French first thing? Like you said, like going into the DMV and speaking French, like if those people that it's not native and it's not their first language, they're going to begin, in my mind, I think they're just going to begin speaking English because they assume everyone knows to speak that. So is it just like, if I do know how to speak French, should I try that first? And then if they don't reciprocate, then go like, okay, I'll move on to English. Like, is that how we grow it to become more familiar and to use it? Like, especially the kids that are learning it in the immersion classrooms? And also, like bridging that gap, like what would make that easier? And the gap by that, I mean, like my mom spoke French because it was spoken in her household. 
I didn't learn to speak French, but now my children are growing up and schools learning to speak French. So I feel like my age group had this gap where we didn't learn it. And we're like surround sandwiched between French speakers. Mm -hmm. um, so what would make it easier for us to learn the language? Well, you know, like every good sandwich, I think it's going to take a little mayonnaise and a little mustard. <laughs> and, you know, just it's a discipline. It's a discipline. And the fact that you are in between two generations, as it were, don't feel like you're, uh, you don't fit. I mean, it's, it's normal in this area. That's normal for us. Embrace it and whatever you get out of it, and the fact that you're going to be incorporating what your children bring, bring to that, it's a beautiful, beautiful contemporary Louisiana French experience. As far as the, the workers who provide the service in French, it might just be a, a button that says bonjour, I don't know. But again, it's going to come mainly from, from your, your part, and I, I know many others out here who are fairly activists about French, and if they suspect that someone speaks French, and you can tell right here, I mean, just about all of us can tell. You listen to someone's accent. You know, you know, you know, I never, I never talked to Councilman Lewis before. Me, tu parles français, toi? I don't know what that means. Sounds, sounds. What about the one of the 150,000? I think I know what it means. Time to wrap it up. Okay. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. We're running behind time. Thank you.